Welcome to YAML, Python's Missing Battery. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. In this course, you will learn all about YAML, including its format and content, the PyYAML third-party Python library, details on reading YAML into your program, as well as spitting it out, and why YAML may cause you to pull out your hair. Code in this course was tested using Python 3.11.1 and PyYAML 6. Note that there are two common versions of the YAML spec, and PyYAML still works with the older version, 1.1. YAML and PyYAML have been around forever, so as long as you get your version of Python to work with your version of PyYAML, you shouldn't have a problem with anything you see in this course. YAML is a common text-based data format that is used for similar things that XML and JSON might be used for. It's human-readable, and like Python, uses white space and indentation to demark groups of things. It supports a wide variety of data types and has reuse mechanisms built in. YAML is quite common in the DevOps space, used to specify access rules and configurations for containers and cloud things. Handling YAML is somewhat surprisingly not included as part of the Python standard library, but there are third-party libraries out there for dealing with it, the most popular of which I'll be covering in this course is PyYAML. Next up, I'll dive into YAML and get you started with reading some simple YAML in Python. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll show you the basic structure of a YAML file and show you how to read it using the PyYAML library. YAML is a text-based data serialization format. It originally stood for yet another markup language, but later versions renamed it to the recursive acronym YAML ain't markup language. So right out of the gate, it can't quite decide whether it's markup or not. Yeah, it's going to be that kind of course. It is text-based and is usually UTF-8 encoded. It has a hierarchical nature, which translates into nested dictionaries quite well and handles the major data types you're accustomed to. It also comes with a mechanism for hooking into your language's specific types as well. The YAML specification has gone through multiple iterations. The most up-to-date is 1.2, but 1.1 is still frequently encountered. In fact, the most popular Python library for YAML is still based on the 1.1 spec. This causes some problems. I'll point those out as you go along. This is a sample YAML file that I borrowed from Wikipedia. Like a dictionary, it's mostly made up of key value pairs. The first line has receipt as the key and Ozware purchase invoice as the value. In this case, that's a string. You can nest the dictionaries, like with the customer item here. In this case, the key in the parent is customer and the value is another dictionary containing the key value pairs of the first name Dorothy and the family name Gail. YAML also supports arrays, also known as sequences. It has a couple of different formats for it, and the one shown here uses dashes. Under the items key is a sequence of two dictionaries, each dictionary being the parts of the warehouse. This is just a taste. Each of these parts and many others will be explained as you proceed through the course. I mentioned in the overview that YAML is often used to solve the same kinds of problems as XML and JSON. Let's compare YAML to XML, JSON, and the newer kid on the block, TOML. First, I'll talk about adoption and support. That's a fancy way of saying popularity. XML and JSON pretty much are the gold standards here. In fact, I'd argue that JSON is even more, at least from the popularity viewpoint. That being said, YAML is still quite common, and there are plenty of solid libraries out there for using it. TOML may be the newer kid on the block, but it has a lot of cross-language support and has become part of Python's standard library as of Python 3.11. TOML's design is very YAML-esque. They pretty much took the good parts of YAML and any files and threw out the bad parts and called it a standard. Second is readability. YAML and TOML win out here. Both are friendly on the eyes using white space to build documents that are human-readable. Those little red asterisks asteri, on YAML and JSON are partially because of variations. JSON is actually pretty readable until you remove all the spaces from it and shrink it down to send it over the wire. Likewise, basic YAML is very readable, but there are some things you can do that make it problematic. 
I'll talk about some of those things in a later lesson. Efficiency is kind of hard to measure. It's more dependent on the library doing the work than the standard. Generally, a simpler standard is going to be faster to parse. And also, the more popular the standard, the more likely someone has optimized the heck out of the parser. JSON tends to win this space due to being simplest and most popular. That said, though, it honestly doesn't matter all that often. As these formats are mostly used for doing simple data storage, the bottleneck in a program isn't typically parsing a file. Last of all is verbosity, and this is where XML loses. XML and HTML, its cousin, drive me crazy. The opening and closing tags are repetitive, the tags have angle brackets around them, too much typing. JSON is the least verbose, but so much so that it impacts its readability. Mismatched braces can be hard to notice because everything is a brace. Nope, I haven't given any of these five stars. If you want a truly small file, you shouldn't be using text. Of course, binary means losing the human readability thing. And it kind of sucks that everything is a trade-off, but that's what makes writing software interesting. The title of this slide sounds like a reality show. Anyhow, YAML gets used a lot in the DevOps space. Lots of container and cloud configuration tools use YAML and often YAML exclusively. I'm not quite sure why this is, but I suspect some early version of a tool did it and others just copied. In addition to the DevOps space, the Open API specification has defined a way of generating REST APIs using a YAML doc. I'll talk in a later lesson on whether you should choose YAML for your project, but a big factor in that question is whether you're operating in a space where YAML is necessary. If you're writing code that interacts with the tools on this slide, writing Python that speaks YAML is probably for you. As I mentioned in the overview, reading and writing YAML isn't built into the Python standard library. There are a bunch of third-party libraries for dealing with it, though, and the most popular of which is called PyYAML. The challenge with PyYAML is it's based on the 1.1 spec for YAML, which means there are a couple things that you can't do and a couple of foot guns that were removed in YAML 1.2 that are still pointed at your toes. Like with most third-party libraries, you can install PyYAML using pip. This would be the point in the course where I remind you to use a virtual environment when installing anything. There, you've been reminded. For the next few lessons, all the examples are going to follow a pattern. I'll show you some YAML, and then I'll show you the Python object that results from that YAML. This takes only a few lines of code, but since I'm going to be doing it a lot, I'm going to put that in a utility function. Seeing as I couldn't resist the tuber-based pun, I'll be writing show spud, a function that reads a YAML file and pretty prints the resulting Python object to the screen. Let's go look at my YAM-inspired function and parse your first YAML document. This is sweetpotato.py. As I said, not a lot of code here. PyYAML's module is called YAML which I'm importing here on line two. As I want to pretty print a Python object to the screen, I'm going to need the pprint function from the pprint module. I'm not a huge fan of this. In fact, in my own code, I almost always convert to JSON and then use the JSON library to pretty print, but that doesn't work for all Python objects, so you're stuck with the weird indentation that the core developers have defined arbitrarily as pretty. Beholder, see beauty, comma, eye of. Anyhow. The show spud function takes the name of a file and opens it. Line 6 is a context manager to open the file. Note that it uses read binary mode. That has to do with the fact that YAML, although text, can use UTF encodings that Python doesn't handle, so the file is opened in binary. The PyYAML module does handle these, though. More on this later. Line 7 is the key thing. This is what you came here for. The PyYAML safe load function. I pass it the file handle, and it returns a Python object based on the YAML file. And finally, I use pprint to make it prettier. Not pretty, but prettier. This function is going to get used over and over in this course. You don't have to memorize it, just understand that anytime you see show spud, that it takes a file name and prints out a Python object composed from the YAML in that file. Got it? Good. Let's go try this out. The top window here has a really simple YAML file inside of it. Notice the hierarchical structure. Each of the yellow labels is the key in a key value pair. 
In some cases, the value is the key value pair below it, and in the case of the name keys, the value is a string. This results in nested dictionaries in Python. Let's parse this baby. Importing my sweet, sweet potato. And calling show spud on this file. As I said, nested dictionaries. The whole document is represented as a dict, with the first key value pair being grandparent and a nested dict. That nested dict has one key value pair, the key parent, and another nested dict. Going all Russian dolls here. Inside of parent, you get two key value pairs, one called child, the other called sibling. Each of these have dictionaries with names and strings inside of them. See what I mean about prettiness? Why can't pretty print display this the way Python black would if this were code? All right, I'll get off that topic now. There you go. You've parsed your first YAML document. In the next lesson, I'll show you all the different data types in YAML and how they look in a doc. If I'm feeling creative, there may be even another YAM-based pun. That'd be sweet. All right, I'll stop now. In the previous lesson, I showed you what a YAML document looks like and how to read it into your program using PyYAML. In this chapter, I'll go into more details about YAML docs and the data structures found within them. The example I parsed in the previous lesson is in the block on top here. YAML is rather flexible when it comes to structure. It also allows inlining. As the structure maps to hashes, known as dicts in Python, it kind of makes sense that you can inline the structure using curly brackets. The block on the bottom here is the equivalent to the top, just using fewer lines. It even uses the same brace brackets or curly brackets as Python, which is convenient for remembering what they mean. Strings in YAML are well, to be blunt, confusing. I get what they were attempting, trying to keep it simple and not require quotes, but the result has a bunch of edge cases that are hard to remember. Strings can be unquoted, quoted using single quotes, or quoted using double quotes, but each of these behaves subtly differently. An unquoted string is considered a literal. If you put a slash n in it, it will be escaped in Python. You won't get a new line, you'll get slash slash n. A single quoted string is almost literal. It also escapes things like slash n, but of course you can't put a single quote or apostrophe inside of it. Rather than using the slash as an escape character as every language on the planet since C has, YAML decided to be different and use two single quotes to indicate a quote. Yeah. You heard me right. If there's two of them in a row, that isn't the end of the string, but the single quote character. This decision baffles me. Double quoted strings are more C-like or Python-like, if you want to talk that way. Inside double quotes, a single quote is just a single quote. You don't have to double them up. And a slash n actually means new line. All these choices for strings gets complicated. If you're coming from almost any programming language, it's going to seem messy. In a moment, I'll show you some examples, but this is one of those areas where YAML makes me a bit uncomfortable. Its decision to allow unquoted strings has some deep ramifications on data type interpolation, which I'll get to more in a bit. There are also some special keyword values in YAML, like true, false, and null. Because these have special meanings, and because YAML normally allows unquoted strings, you get weirdness here. True, on its own, is not a string. The phrase true dat, on the other hand, is. Like I said, ramifications. Let's go to the REPL and see this mess in some code. In the top window, I have a YAML document with five lines and five different data cases. The first is an unquoted string. The second uses single quotes. The third uses double quotes. The special key has the Boolean true as its value. And the more special key has this uncool cat's fully written version of the slang phrase true dat. Let's use show spud to see what happens with this doc. For the unquoted string, the single quote is a single quote 
and the slash n becomes slash slash n in Python. The slash is escaped rather than becoming a new line. For the single quoted string, you see the use of the single quote to escape itself. There's two in the YAML, but only one in the Python. And like the unquoted version, the slash in slash n is escaped. The double quoted string is the most normal. Did you hear the air quotes in my voice? Let's not speak of air quotes. Somebody on the YAML standards committee might get inspired. Slash n in this case is new line and two single quotes in a row are what they're supposed to be, two single quotes. So regular double quotes is the way to go. As I mentioned in the slide, true is a keyword. Although it looks like an unquoted string, it isn't. It becomes a Boolean. And but if you stick something after it, it becomes a string again. This kind of reminds me of what one of the things that drives me crazy in JavaScript. Automatic casting of variables causes surprises. One of the reasons I like Toml is it's stuck with normal string behavior. There's those air quotes again. Let's go through all the data types that YAML supports. The null keyword means empty. You denote it with the word null, a tilde, or just by leaving something empty. True and false are acceptable for Boolean in YAML 1.2. In YAML 1.1, remember, that's the one PyYAML uses, you also have yes, no, on, and off. I get why these are here. They're meant to make the file more readable. But remember when I spoke of ramifications? Well, those got removed from the spec for just that reason. I'll dive deeper into this later. YAML supports integers in decimal, binary, hex, and octal. YAML 1.2 uses the O notation for octal numbers, while YAML 1.1 uses a leading zero. In addition to integers, you can also get floats, including markers for infinity and not a number. I worked with a programmer once whose name was Nan. Man, did he hate floating point jokes. I already showed you the weird, wonderful, woolly world of YAML strings. And finally, there are dates. Dates can also be a little tricky. The year, month, date format is handled nicely, but adding the time can be problematic upon occasion. YAML handles a couple more variations on date and timestamps than I have here. If you're doing a lot of timestamp work, you'll want to look the details up. Note that null, true, and false are all keywords in YAML, and all of these can be lower, upper, or mixed case. YAML isn't picky. Let's go play with a couple of these data types in the REPL. In the top window here, I have a larger YAML file. Let me load it into Python, then I'll go over it a few data types at a time. Import. Read the file. And let me just scroll up. The first keys here are variations on null. Note the two different letter cases for the word as well as the use of the tilde. The next three are booleans. Because PyYAML is YAML 1.1 based, the keyword yes is a boolean. Like with null, either different letter case can be supported. Let me scroll down here a bit and I'll talk about some numbers. 10 is decimal 10. 0B10 is binary, giving you 2 in decimal. 0X10 is hex, giving you 16 decimal. And 010 in YAML 1.1 is octal, giving you decimal 8. 0010 is YAML 1.2, so PyYAML sees this as a string. You need to be very aware of what version your parser is using and make sure your file is using the same thing. Okay, on to some floats. Using both numbers with decimal points and exponents, as well as infinity and good old Nan. I wonder how he's doing. Scrolling down a little more. I must have been in a morbid mood when I wrote this example. Trinity is the first test of the atomic bomb. Notice the subtle difference between Trinity and not Trinity. The first has seconds specified in the timestamp, and the second does not. The first becomes a Python date time object, while the second becomes a string. When I showed you this sample YAML document in the previous lesson, I mentioned that YAML supports sequences, also known as arrays. There are two different ways of writing these, either using the Python-friendly square brackets in line, or by using dashes, kind of like a bullet list in a document. Both of these result in the same situation. 
Note that you can either put leading spaces or not in front of those dashes. The YAML documents I normally use tend to put the spaces here, and I think it's clearer as that list does belong to the hash being created by the key, but it does work without them. And speaking of hashes, I've kind of touched on most of this when introducing the basic YAML structure. But just to be a completionist, YAML supports dictionaries. You've seen the nesting and the inline feature, but there's also one more variation as well. You can have an anonymous hash inside of a list segment. The children dict here has a list of dicks. The list has two anonymous dicks in it, each with first name and date of birth key value pairs inside. YAML is a text-based format with automatic casting of content, which is technically text, into the supported data types. As I've pointed out, this can cause some weirdnesses. YAML 1.1 has the additional bit of fun of supporting base 60 values. The original committee must have had some ancient Mayan members. 2012 forever. Anyhow, base 60 is denoted using a colon, which can create some surprises. 22 colon 22 is base 60, turning into 1342 in Python. Putting a leading zero like I've done here, which to me looks like the way military time writes 24 hour time, becomes a string. Without the leading zero, it's base 60. Without the leading zero, but using hours, minutes, and seconds, it's a timestamp. In Python, that turns into Wait for it, not a date-time object, but an integer counting the number of seconds since midnight. And finally, take the same thing and put a leading zero on it, and you're back to a string. You having fun yet? You can get around some of this by using YAML tags, which can be used to specify what a chunk of text should be interpreted as. A tag is denoted by bang bang tag. That's exclamation mark, exclamation mark for those of you who haven't spent time playing with mainframes. Yes, I am that old. Some tags are built into YAML and others are parser specific. I'll talk about some of the PyYAML specific ones in a later lesson. Let's look at a couple of YAML specific tags. Bang bang float forces the number to be a float. Even though I didn't put the dot zero here, Python will see it as 3.0. Bang bang string forces a string. If I want 22 colon 22 to be a string rather than base 60, this is how I do it. There's even bang bang binary. This takes base 64 encoded text, and in Python, that becomes a binary value. Yep, you can use YAML to write out GIF data. The implementation of tags is a little creaky. In writing this course, I played with some of the YAML 1.1 tags and found some that I couldn't get to work in PyYAML. I'm not sure if I was doing something wrong with bang bang timestamp, but I couldn't get a timestamp out of any of the examples that I previously showed you. I don't know whether this is the spec or PyAML's implementation or me just not doing it right, but it was less than fun. All right, if that last little bit didn't scare you off, the next little bit might. In the next lesson, I'll show you why I was cautious when I said that YAML was readable.